Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! Today, if you hit too hard, right? They hit too hard, 15 yards, throw him out of the game. They had that last week. I watched for a couple of minutes, and two guys just really beautiful tackle. Boom, 15 yards. The referee gets on television. His wife is sitting at home. She's so proud of him. They're ruining the game, right? It's been a little more than a year since Donald Trump waged war on the NFL. Our next guest reveals the true root of his grudge against the league, which can be traced back to Trump's ownership of the New Jersey Generals, a team that was part of a short-lived league called the United States Football League of the 1980s, the USFL. Joining us now, New York Times best-selling author of eight books, Jeff Perlman. His latest is titled Football for a Buck, The Crazy Rise and Crazier Demise of the USFL. It shows how much of Trump's behavior in office was perhaps foreshadowed by his tenure in that defunct football league. Also with us, chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine, Mark Leibovich. Lebo. He's the author of the book, Big Game, the NFL in well, Danger here we go. Times. Two great books, sort of companion pieces. Well, NFL, I'm in my wheelhouse here. Yeah. Okay. This is going to be all I'm, I'm ready. Yeah. Run this. I'm, I'm going to start Take it off. Away, make it, make it uh, kick off the question. I'll kick it off. Okay. Kick it off. Here we go. Here we go. So, Jeff, this Willie? book is <laughs> so fun, such a page turner. There are so many incredible stories and Donald Trump is at the center of, of a lot of it. So I'm just going to pick one and we can go from there. Donald Trump wrote a letter to other league owners in the USFL, this is back in the day, insisting they contribute to the salary of his player, Heisman Trophy winning quarterback Doug Flutie. The letter reads this, this is written by Donald Trump. As you're aware, and as I announced at our owners meeting prior to signing Doug Flutie, I would come back and ask the owners to bear some of the costs of Doug's contract. I did not need Doug as a player, but felt the league <laughs> desperately needed oh someone Lord. or something fast. As it turns out, it was more successful than even our wildest expectations. Everyone is now benefiting from Doug Flutie. I would appreciate you putting on the next agenda the allocation of Doug Flutie's cost to each team. So he drafts a player on his team and wants to spread the costs around because it was such a brilliant decision. Yeah, it was. Uh, I always say Doug Flutie was the Mexico wall before the Mexico wall, <laughs> but he actually was. Donald Trump signs Flutie. He doesn't even need him, but he signs him to a six-year, $8.3 million deal. It was the biggest contract in pro football at that time. Yeah. And he tells his partners with the generals, don't worry, we're going to sign Doug Flutie, but the rest of the league is going to pay for it. That's his literal pitch to the other owners. Right. To the other, so he writes a letter to the commissioner, and he tells the other owners, I have signed Doug Flutie for the good of you. Right. I'm giving this to you as a gift to the league. You will pay for it. And the other owners, much like Mexico, collectively gave him the middle finger and never paid a dime and thought it was preposterous. So the story of the USFL, there's so much to say about it. First of all, it was a fun league. It had some successful franchises, some of which maybe would have become NFL franchises if it had been allowed to play out. But Donald Trump gets in the league. New Jersey Generals are his team. Yeah. But from day one, he wanted an NFL franchise. So this was a stepping stone for him, which may have led to the collapse of the league. It was a scam. I'm not even just saying it. It really was a scam. He, uh, he bought the Generals after the first season. The first season was 1983. It was a spring league. He bought the Generals. They were on sale for $8.5 million. He paid $10 million because he thought there was a bidding war that didn't exist. He gets the Generals, and he immediately, in the lead-up to buying the team, always telling the other people with the USFL, is, um, I'm so excited to be a part of this league. This is a great league. I love what you're doing. He gets the Generals. We need to move to fall. We have to move to fall. We need to take on the immediately. NFL. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. He has a meeting with Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the NFL, at the Pierre Hotel. Donald Trump pays for the suite. In this meeting, he says to Rozelle, I don't care about the USFL. You tell me what I have to do to get an NFL franchise. It was preposterous. He did it. He basically went behind the backs of the fellow owners. To get, and Pete Rozelle says to him, as long as I am with the NFL, as long as my heirs are with the NFL, you will never have a team in this league. Because he saw him for what he, he considered him to be a con man. And so, so that plants the seed of resentment oh with Donald Trump God. and the NFL. So, again, let's get to, I mean, the Times big piece on his uh, taxes and his father funding every failed enterprise that Donald had for years. He is a, f a, a financial fool in terms of buying the team. The team was on the market for, what, eight and a half million? Eight and a half. And he, he paid, paid what? He paid ten. And uh, he, his whole thing was about getting an NFL franchise. That's the only reason he did this, was to get an NFL franchise. It wasn't about the USFL. It wasn't about the good of the league. It was about getting an NFL franchise. And he thought he could sue. He led a lawsuit against the NFL. The USFL ended up suing the NFL in a very famous lawsuit. Yeah. And they famously won a dollar. 
and that was the death of the USFL. But do you, do you have any sense of, were any of these teams viable enough so that the USFL had hung on another few years, some of them actually could have been absorbed into the NFL? Yeah, so, you know, the strike came along in 87, yeah. right. and there was a strike where they used replacement players. I've talked to a ton of guys in the USFL and NFL who say if, if the USFL had hung on just two years, you have this mass chaos and anarchy in mm -hmm. football. And, and there were teams, there's a team in Jacksonville before the Jaguars, there's a team in Tennessee before the Titans, mm -hmm. there's a team in Baltimore after the Colts left, there's a team in Birmingham doing really well, and there was a team in Oakland after the Raiders were gone. I think you would have almost inevitably had some sort of merger. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Eddie Glott is with us, and Eddie um, looks like, you know, it starts as a personal gripe and, and cut to the past couple of years, he turns this into a complete culture war. Absolutely. What what I'm trying to figure out, Jeff and, and, and Mark, is it seems like the record is replete with examples of Donald Trump as a con man. Uh, that we knew, we knew who he was, uh, and we keep getting evidence of who he currently is. How do we continue to fall for his con? That's, that's the question I'm sitting here grappling with. Jeff? <laughs> Jeff I, I do have one thing I will say. You got no answer for that one, because I don't either. The NFL thing drives me insane. Let me yeah. just say this. Why? Donald Trump tries buying the Baltimore Colts in 1980, fails. He meets with Pete Rozelle to get a franchise, fails. Mm -hmm. He tries suing the NFL, fails. He tries buying the Buffalo Bills, fails. Mm -hmm. He tries buying the New England Patriots, mm -hmm. fails. When he's an owner of a franchise in the USFL, he's regularly sitting there doing work during the national anthem. Like, and which is no crime. Anyone who's been in a press box has worked during the national it's anthem. It's a sign of protest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is all, it is the biggest, for a guy who hates the NFL, he sure wants to be in the NFL. Yeah. Wow. You know, it was the club he could not get into. Oh, another one. Joe? Well, that, I was going to say that's one of many, many clubs he was never allowed to get into. Yep. And it stings, still stings every day. You know, Mark Leibovich, we have sort of the coming together of two stories here. One, uh, the USFL, and two, uh, the story of his father transferring millions and millions of dollars to him. Mm -hmm. He gets in the USFL, uh, they, they let him in, he's the biggest champion of the USFL, then gets behind their back, tries to stab him in the back, and tells Roselle he wants to get in the NFL. He doesn't care about the USFL. Same thing with his father, who's shoveling millions and millions of dollars to him throughout his entire life. And at the end of his father's life, he tries to screw his own dad by <laughs> changing a will, uh, according to the New York Times, and, and, and scares his father uh, because uh, it would be to his detriment to bail out his son. And I think, you know, the, the strain that runs through those two things is just his absolute belief in the power of marketing and hype and his ability to talk through and sell anything and, and just think that at the end of the day, you know, the facts will, you know, may, if they ever come out, they'll come out, you know, decades down the road, like in the New York Times over, you know, a 12,000 word piece which, you know, by that time he'll be halfway around the world, or in this case in the White House. So, again, I mean, I think it's just sort of part of a pattern that he essentially has built his career on, whether it's a house of cards or, or you know, the greatest marketing scam in history. Jeff, another it great anecdote sad. in the story comes in 1984 when Trump wants to sign Lawrence Taylor away from the Giants and on to the Generals. Oh, yeah. And so he has a meeting with Lawrence Taylor's agents, and then a, a publicist goes by the name of John Barron. You've heard of him. Starts calling around, who sounds a lot like Donald Trump. Yeah. And you have you quote a writer from the Gannett Westchester paper quote: "We knew it was Donald the whole time. He wasn't even good at changing his voice. It was embarrassing." <laughs> so he was calling around saying, "Wow, Trump's a genius. He got Lawrence Taylor to leave the Giants and come to the Generals, which was not true." When he signed Doug Flutie, if you do a, just a Nexus search for John Barron and Doug Flutie, there are quotes all over the place from. John John, John Barron, how great Doug Flutie is for the league, and Mr. Trump is a genius. It, it is a joke. God. It's a joke. The joke's on us. Yeah. I you know, he mean, also used America. Roy Cohn. He also hired Roy Sad. Cohn as his attorney for the league and told the other owners, we're going to hire Roy Cohn. The NFL is going to want to settle immediately because they're going to be terrified of this guy. The book, Football for a Buck, The Crazy Rise and Crazier Demise of the USFL. It's out now. Jeff Perlman, thanks so much it's for great. being on. Get the book. It's Mark Leibovich, thank you as well. Your book, yep. also Big great Game. Book. No, Big also Game. Great. Yeah. The NFL one, one in Dangerous <laughs> Times. <laughs> All right, final. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.